series, we're going to talk about wounded guests. And I, I suppose if you've ever been a host um, at an event, as, as we just had, as Gloria just led on last night, there's always people at the table that are hurting. They may not speak up. You may not notice. But how many know there's always hurting people around us? Some of us actually go out of our way to, to you know, ignore them, and you're going to get verbally abused this morning if you're one of those. Wounded guests. So let's pick up the story. We're in Luke chapter 9. We're preaching through the book of Luke. Not every verse, not every story, but there's about 10 different times that Jesus meets around the table with people. Uh, or there's some kind of meal involved, uh, or some type of hospitality. So, um, and I want you to be reading through this with us, and by next week, at least get through at least chapter, the first 10 chapters of Luke. So, and it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, how many notice Jesus is good at asking questions? He'd have been a good counselor, psychologist. Because he always asks life-changing questions instead of just telling people what they should know. And he said, who do the crowds say that I am? He sets them up. So they answered and said, John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Others say one of the old prophets has risen again. Time to get up, yeah. I don't know what this thing is. All right. It's a new app. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? You know, we talk about what other people think. Who do you think I am? This is, remember now, this is getting towards the end of his ministry. This is the last, you know, the last several days of his ministry. Who do you say that I am? They've been with him three years. Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. And he strictly warned them and commanded them to tell this to no one. He's definitely not a church of God preacher. All right. Saying the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. They must not have heard that part. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, they've been following him for three years. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. Not like, oh, yeah, I decided that 10 years ago. No, every, every, Paul said, I die daily. Y'all are kind of slow today. You okay? Daily, daily, I die daily. Daily, okay? Um, And take up his cross daily and follow me. Follow me, okay? For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? There's four very important points about hospitality and discipleship here. And the first point is this. If you lose, you have to lose your life to gain your life. Uh, we've heard this scripture a hundred times, and it goes right over. It goes, because we don't, we don't like to talk about this much. I, I'm going to use an example. A couple Thursday nights ago, uh, Michelle was preaching uh, or sharing a, a devotion She's talk, talking about abortion. And you know what? There's a whole lot of people in this world that find themselves pregnant and they decide to get an abortion because it's going to mess up their life. So they'll kill a fetus to save so that they can go to college or they can get that job or they can... You know, that guy that doesn't want kids and (laughs) whatever it might be. And it seems like abortion's more about convenience than medical concerns. 
And when she was sharing this, it just hit me. If you lose your life, you gain your life. And maybe things will happen to you in your life and it throws you off track and you start going in a direction that's different. But if God's in it, how many know every child is a gift from God? Amen. And I know if you've been there and you've done that, God will give you forgiveness. And I'm not here to fuss at you and throw guilt at you. But I'm here to say to you, that sometimes things happen to us and our whole lives get messed up and changed. But, if you, but either you believe it or you're not, God's in charge of your life. And sometimes you have to lose your life to gain your life. Whew. And who knows? I, I don't get it. Why people are so, so easily will, will give up a life. You know, I'm, I'm so strange. You know, when you plant things in the garden, you have they, they grow up too close, and you have to thin them. You, I know, I know. I pull that those three those those radishes are too close, and I, I have to pull one up. And that that could have been a radish. I know I'm weird. That could have been a radish. I mean, I can't even thin plants. I don't know how some. You think about the potential. You have to lose your life to gain your life. Okay, right after this, Jesus begins a journey. If you can, I don't know if you could see a map in your head, but he begins a journey from Galilee way to the north to through Samaria in the center down to Judea and Jerusalem in the south. And he begins this journey. And, and really, Luke, Luke spends about 10 chapters on this journey. And this journey, only, it's only like nine days. You can make it in five, but Jesus is slow. So, so they take about nine days to go through this this journey from north to south, these 10 chapters, that's like 40% of Luke's gospel is about these days. So how many believe maybe there's something important here? Jesus is about to go to Jerusalem. Almost all his ministry is in Galilee to the north. But now he's going to Jerusalem. Anybody know why he's going to Jerusalem? That's where he'll be crucified. So this is toward the end of his three years of ministry. And he begins this uh, talk on discipleship and hospitality. Let's go back to Luke chapter 9, and let's pick it up in verse 51, just, just a couple verses. Now, it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set, very determined, right, his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. So they went, so this group went ahead to make arrangements for him to come. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, I love this. Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? As Elijah did. I love this. James and John been with Jesus three years, and this is still the way they are. If Jesus couldn't straighten them out in three years, I feel good about the 40 years I've had with some of you. <laughs> wow. Hey, Jesus, you want us to call fire down from heaven? You're, you're leaning a little over your skis right now. This is, this is crazy. Makes me feel good, though. This is the way people get sometimes when they get a little power, when they get a little authority, when they get a little exposure. Sometimes they want to start calling fire down from heaven. But that leads us to our second point. Our calling is to save and build up, not tear down. You need to know your spirit. Know what kind of spirit you have in you. Are you an edifier or are you one that tears 
down. That's our, our calling. Okay. Chapter 10 opens up, and Jesus calls the 70. We don't know where these 70 came from, but we know a lot of people are following Jesus, so they must have been part of the crowd. But can you imagine Jesus appointing 70 people? There's that number again. And he appointed 70 people, sent them out two by two. And, and of course, the number is highly significant because after the flood, there were 70 nations named. Moses had 70 elders. 70 people went to Egypt with Jacob. 70 years of captivity. The Sanhedrin had 70 members. So it's an all-inclusive number, and Jesus is saying, I'm going to cover the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not that day, but he's going to do it. And when they came back, they're kind of like the disciples a little bit. They were rejoicing, right? Remember this? They were rejoicing because they had power over the demons. Now, I got to admit, it makes me smile too. I think it's cool when you can talk to a demon and tell him to get out, and he gets out. I know it scares some of you. As soon as you see a demon, you're like, mm-hmm. It doesn't scare me at all because I know in whom I've believed. And I know how powerful the It's nothing to do with me, nothing to do with anything I do or don't do. It's all about the name of Jesus. And devils will cringe at the name of Jesus. My Lord. So Jesus says, don't rejoice because you have power over the enemy. Rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. In other words, he's saying, don't rejoice because of your accomplishments. Rejoice because of your relationship. I, I, th- I think I need to say that again because some of you are, your eyes just glazed over. Don't rejoice in your accomplishments Rejoice in your relationship. Rejoice that you know the Savior and the King and your name's in his book. Everything else is just him anyway. So that's what we need. That's what our joy needs to depend on. If you get it, say amen. Okay, next point. We're almost done. <laughs> Lord, no one believes this. So now let's, 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 uh, let's, let's illustrate this. Let's illustrate this. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. This is a familiar story. Luke chapter 10. And behold, a certain, uh, well, the story will come later. Let me do something else. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? You know, some people want to talk to you and some people want to test you. He, Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? Here's another great question. What do you think the answer is? What is your reading of it? And he gives gives the right answer, right? He answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. That's how Christians live. That's not how you get saved. You're saved by grace. You're not saved by doing good things to people, but that's how you live. But he, wanting to justify, said to him, but who is my neighbor? See, see, see the problem is there's, they're in Samaria, and there's Jews living there, but mostly Samaritans. And you got to understand the Jews and Samaritans. I think the best way to put it is it's like the Israelis and Palestinians today. In fact, the ancient Samaritans are probably the ancestors of the Palestinians. And Jesus right now is in the West Bank area. So he's in Palestinian territory. So you got to understand how many know Jews and Palestinians do not get along. And it's not just that they don't get along. They believe that they were religiously wrong. 
They're not, they're not Muslim. They're claiming to be Jews when they weren't Jews. Long story about that. It goes all the way back to Joshua. I don't have time. But, but they worship differently than these Jews. So basically, they were prejudiced. The Jews were superior, Samaritans inferior. Don't touch them. Don't talk to them. They're unclean. <laughs> Are you getting the picture? So he wants to justify himself because surely we wouldn't count Samaritans. You know, church people are pretty good, most of us, at being good to each other. But when we see a sinner, some of us feel justified to treat him any old way. If I don't get more amens, I might stay here five minutes. If you're uncomfortable now, I can make you squirm. Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. When he said, who is my neighbor, what he's really saying is, who don't I have to be good to? Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and with all your strength and your neighbor as you. Who don't I have to love? When they said good Samaritan, those words don't go together. Samaritans are not good. They're evil. It's like saying a good Palestinian. It, let me put it. How about this? Let me put it away. How about... A good, the good illegal alien. No. <laughs> Put whatever you want there. He's basically asking, who do I not have to love? Who is my neighbor? Wow. And Jesus answered. He said, well, let me tell you a story. Okay, I'm done with my introduction. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, okay? This is about a, this is about a uh, I think about a 17 miles. It's all downhill. You go, you go 3,000 feet down, so it's quite a, quite a, a decline. Uh, and, um, and about 17 miles, and it's real treacherous. It's not a four-lane highway. You're not in a car. There's bandits everywhere. It's, it's a dangerous road, and, you, and it, it takes a while to go 17 miles. And it says a certain man went to, and fell among thieves, stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and left him half dead, half dead. In other words, he looked dead. Now, by chance, a certain, pre, a certain pastor came down, that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a deacon, maybe an elder, maybe just an ordinary Christian, likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, say he looked, and passed by on the other side. Now, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. The oil is, is for um, is, is soothing. Uh, it, it, it helps with the healing process. The wine purifies the wound. And he set him on his own animal. So, in other words, he's walking now, instead of writing, and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. So there they are at the Holiday Inn. And the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii. We're not sure exactly how much two denarii is, but it is at least a month's salary, probably two months' salary. That's a lot of money. Gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. Whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he's kind of like, yeah, I guess the one who showed mercy. 
Go and do likewise. How many believe he did? No. No. You got to understand to touch. Because why did the priest walk by? Because he looked dead. And you can't touch a dead body. Because if you touch a dead body, then you're unclean. There's a thing you can go through to get clean again. But if you're unclean, you can't do your religious stuff. So he chose religious stuff over real ministry. We need to decide, you know, there's, there's the Lord's work and then there's church work. Now, church work is good. It needs to be done. God will reward you, bless you. Pastor appreciates you. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for your service. It's wonderful. But don't ever put church work ahead of the ministry God's called you to. And, and by the way, don't put church work ahead of family. But God's work the specific thing he's telling you to do today, that comes ahead of family. That comes ahead of everything. If God tells you to do something, you need to do it. And I don't care if Aunt Bessie likes it or not. Everybody with me on that, prioritizing. So he wanted to do his religious work. Hmm. And in the process, and watch what it says here. It said he saw him but pass by. He saw him, but pass by. How many people do we see, but we pass by? And I know you think, well, I, I can't remember a time I ever did that. Yeah, but what about society in general? Do we really care what's going on? Every year, 900,000 babies are aborted. Is anyone disturbed? Is anyone praying? One out of every six teenagers has seriously considered suicide. One out of six. Are we loving our teens? Every day, 22 veterans take their life. Every day. Every day. Today, there's 22 of them going to the grave. 22 yesterday. 22 tomorrow. I didn't come by to depress you. I came by to tell you, we've got some wounded guests. We have some wounded people around us. You know, I heard about one church that they, for membership, they required that they did some kind of outreach to somebody, either in the church, one of their programs, or outside of the church. But they had to, do, they had to be a part of some kind of, of ministry or organization or effort to, that reaches out and helps somebody or they couldn't join the church. How many members would we lose if we made that rule? I don't know if we'd lose that many. Most, you know, there's, there's a lot of people involved, not just in the church, but in ministries outside the church. And by the way, God bless you for doing it. It doesn't bother me at all. Wherever the Lord sends you, go and do it. Come on, anybody with me in this place? I know it's a weird sermon, but are you okay? This, this, this has to be... This has to be shared. The Levite sees him, but passes by, passes by. Wow. We need to realize what the real work of ministry is and do it. Say amen. amen. You know, the story kind of takes a strain. He said, you know, who, then, then, then who, I think we expect to say, okay, okay, the Levite, uh, he's busy doing things, and the priest, well, he's the priest. He's got important responsibilities. Surely one of the other Jews, just a regular a member of the synagogue, a member of the church will step up and do it. No, it's this illegal alien. <laughs> it's this Palestinian. It's this person who's on the outskirts of society. It's, on, it's this person that, that, that it's... It's a tax collector. Now I'm, now I'm preaching. He steps up, and Jesus says, that's your neighbor. That's the neighbor. That's the guy 
who helps out. Anybody with me in this place? Wow. So in conclusion, Jesus redefines neighbor, redefines what love is. And I guess the whole thing about wounded guests is I, I know sometimes we come to church thinking, I need fill in the blank. I'm here for fill in the blank. I hope pastor preaches this. Boy, if Michelle would just sing that song, I know I could shout. <laughs> if we just did this, if we just did that. But we need to understand while you're sitting at the table, there's some wounded people around us. And we can't just see them. We need to go to them. Anybody hearing me? Not just see them, but go to them. And let me leave you with this thought, too. This message brings us hope because sometimes we're the guy in the ditch. Sometimes we're the one that's hurting. Sometimes we need a touch from Somebody to pray for me. Somebody to encourage me. Just give me a hug. Give me a smile. Just give me an encouraging word. Anybody ever been there? Anybody? I mean, it's okay to, to come to church and say, yeah, I do need someone to speak into my life today. I'm hurting. I need a touch from heaven. We think about people sitting around the table. We think about how you know, the good times, how fun that is. But you need to understand the person sitting right next to you might be hurting. And maybe you've been invited to the table when you're hurting. Aren't you glad you're in a church that can not just see you, but love on you? Someone told me this morning, she said, I, I was in another church for 10 years, and I never felt the Holy Spirit. 10 years, never felt the Holy Spirit. She said, I feel the Holy Spirit every time I come to journey. Oh, I feel them right now, church. I feel them right now. You may not like this message, but I feel them right now. <laughs> come on, this is a message. This is one of those liver messages we need to hear. Come on, sometimes you got to eat the liver. Sometimes you gotta, you got you gotta, you got to take it in. Come on, and you, you got to say, okay, what, I, I've seen a lot of hurt. What have I done? Or maybe you're here today and you say, I'm hurting. I need a good neighbor. Would you stand with me? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for your love and for your presence today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. Mm -mm 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 -mm. I want to pray for you. I want you to come to the communion tables. It's a table. It's where we take in the body and the blood of Jesus. Amen. <sighs> Besides, it's 10 to 12. I can't let you go. It's my religion. <laughs> but I do feel him. He's so good. Because you know what? Jesus is that good Samaritan. He took me in. He poured in the oil. He poured in the wine. Gave me to an innkeeper of the church and said, whatever you need, I'll provide. Oh, I feel good about that as the pastor. That whatever we need for your healing, he will provide it. It's already money in the bank that can be given out. How many know I'm not talking about real money? He is the good Samaritan. He picks us up. He's the one who ministers. Let's pray if our prayer team would come. Father, in the name of Jesus, how we love you today. You're a good, good father. 
And there's none like you. None like you. <laughs> Father, if, there, if there's even one that needs healing, needs a touch from heaven, I pray that you would answer that. Be the good Samaritan. Pour in the oil. Pour in the wine. Touch their lives today. Turn their situation around physically, financially, emotionally. Whatever needs to be done, you're the way maker. And you'll make a way where there is no way. So bless us, Lord, as we pray and bless us as we come around the table, as we bring our, our, our spouse and our family. We just come around the table and we just love on you and worship you today. You said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The altar is open. Would you just come? If you need prayer for any reason, I want you to just come as, as everyone else comes for the tables. Let's receive communion. And if you need prayer, we'll pray with you. Let's worship the Lord. Please take a few minutes and just worship. Think on the message. How does it apply to you? Don't just see the message. Let's do the message. Amen. Let's worship the Lord.
to be in God's house this morning, amen. You know, I'm glad I'm Pentecostal this morning. I'm glad I don't go to a dead church. <laughs> I couldn't imagine going to a church not feeling anything, you know. I couldn't imagine going to every Sunday and not, not feeling the Lord, not feeling His presence. There's nothing like the presence of the Lord, amen. There's nothing like this, the Holy Ghost when He comes and breaks the chains of bondage, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm glad that I'm going to a spirit-filled church this morning. You know, there's not a whole lot of churches left out there that are Pentecostal, really. And we are we are fortunate that we we serve a God that comes on the scene. Amen. I want to go ahead and close and read the blessing this morning. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Praise God. Let's go out this week and have a good week. Let's celebrate the presence of God. Amen. You're going to be dismissed. Praise God. Hallelujah.